He is the metadata national digital library library hosted by ITI Kharagpur, IIT Kharagpur. He is the member of advisory committee of National Virtual Library, a project by Ministry of Culture and of Government of India. He has developed online and e-learning portal of Vidyasagar University. And he is at present running three online courses in Shayam platform. Thank you, Tonushri, for choosing such a topic and for choosing such a great personality, Dr. Partha Sharthi to talk on learn, unlearn, and relearn. As you know, as futurist and the philosopher Alvin Toffler once wrote, the illiterate of 21st century will not be those who cannot read and write, but those who cannot learn, who cannot unlearn and relearn. We are now in the world where the perpetual evolution to the point where we are talking about the third generation, a new industrial revolution, where fusion of information technology and biotechnology is taking place. Regarding the learn, unlearn, and relearn, uh, one uh, very simple example we can give, we can uh, state here that I have uh, uh, known that eight hours sleep for a person is necessary for his good health, good thinking, good being. eight hours, but five hours we'll do. Then what we did? Eight hours we learn first, then we unlearn. No, not eight hours is not required. Five hours is sufficient. Then we started to practice these five hours sleep a day. But after a few months or few years, we observe that the productivity of a person has been decreased. For some persons it may increase, for some persons it may decrease. For practicing high hours sleep, then they unlearn that part, then relearn to go back to that eight hours. In some cases that may not be going back, maybe new other ideas, though it depends on person to person. Now, on this very topic, what Dr. Partha Sajdi Mukhubhata is going to elaborate and he will enlighten us regarding this first century mantra, learn, unlearn, and relearn. Finally, I will conclude saying this. Before starting the session, I would request all the participants, please turn off your microphone and video option. Please mute your microphone and video option. Please mute your microphone and video option. I think principal sir has left. Okay, thank you.
thank you uh, thank you dr gautam bit uh, now i would uh, like to introduce our speaker dr partha sharathi mukhopadhyay presently he is working as professor in department of library and information science university of kollani nodia west bengal he is an open source enthusiastic he is a member of oha international team Uh, principal sir has already introduced him uh, so um, i would request our speaker uh, dr partha sharathi mukhopadhyay to begin his session thank you uh, tarushri yes, am i audible yes sir you are audible okay fine so <clears throat> before starting uh, you know Uh, my deliberation here on the uh, learn unlearn and relearn uh, philosophy as principles sir already said that it's a given by alvin toffler long back in 1984 okay so uh, that we never understood it that uh, why should we all learn after learning something but as principles sir uh, explained very elaborately that uh, you know life is such a complex uh, thing nowadays that uh, we have to learn we have to unlearn because before uh, relearning you need to unlearn i am giving you a very simple example say for example you all are using uh, different kind of web browsers now the moment a major release come uh, of uh, that particular browser like uh, firefox or uh, you know google chrome etc so you see initial few days we are basically in a dilemma that uh, where are the uh, old uh, menus where are the old uh, you know icons i am not uh, finding these i am not finding that so we need to unlearn the previous version before relearning the new version of the software and the world is moving towards a principle called perpetual beta there will be no final version of anything uh, uh, true for a software true for a piece of writing suppose you are writing a paper and publishing in a journal so uh, the moment it pub it, it got published uh, we uh, think that this is the stable version but nowadays if electronic publishing platform allows us to again change that particular you know published versions of the paper with the new data with rectification with modification so nothing is permanent uh, nowadays uh, the way we thought uh, previously everything is perpetual beta and that is true for uh, the academy as well uh, so this is the backdrop uh, of uh, this particular uh, deliberation that uh, what should we uh, relearn what should we unlearn and as a teacher as an academia or as a student of a particular uh, higher education system what are the focus that what uh, why oh, what are the things that we need to you know uh, give emphasis or give a concentration uh, to uh, point out our future direction so let us start uh, i am trying to share uh, my uh, views i am making my video up uh, because of the poor bandwidth uh, uh, today morning so i am just uh, trying to share my presentation here first and i will go for some kind of live uh, demonstration i i think uh, right from this point of time i have 45 minutes of uh, you know uh, time slot so anyway let us start so now i am trying to share my screen it will take a few second please bear with me there will be 10 seconds of delay from my end to your end yes sir uh, no, not visible but uh, the screen is become white white okay now it will be coming hopefully oh. and you can see so the topic is that uh, the learn uh, learn relearn academia 2.0 uh, 
new mantra for student teachers and librarians. Yeah. So the first, yeah. is it busy? No, sir. Hello. No, no sir. Yeah, not busy, still. Yes, sir. Yeah, it's it came. Now it's visible, sir. There will be a test. Ah, there will be a ten second delay. Don't worry. From my end to your end, there will be a ten second delay because it is all almost at the same time it is going YouTube also, na? So there will yeah. be a ten second delay. Anyway, <clears throat> now uh, I am hopeful that you can see the that uh, the topic is learn, learn and relearn. Academia two point zero. When we are saying something like two point zero. So that means there uh, there was a one point zero, and two point zero means the second generation academic. All three facets of academia that is teaching. Participants are requested to mute your microphone and video option, please. All the participants are requested to mute your video and microphone. I think there is some technical difficulties. Our speaker will join us soon. Please bear with us. Yeah, I I rejoined. Yes, sir. Because Google left me out. Google actually kicked me out from your webinar. Anyway, I'm trying again. I think now it is visible. Can you see? Not yet, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. It's visible. So, uh, meanwhile, what I mean actually, uh, this may happen sometimes because of the network bandwidth problem. Because uh, you know, when you are contacting a video conferencing like this, we need uh, almost 10 Mbps per second uh, link uh, connectivity. So we already know the paradigm shift already you know happened. Now, why? What do I mean by paradigm shift in academy? Four fundamental facets for the last 15 years, changing our way we as teachers and students interact with different kind of academic activities. These four pillars: are open and distributed information system. We call it, call it, call it internet. The internet of open source software and open standards. So the Entire building block, the platform we are presently conducting our learning, uh, uh, you know, uh, evaluation activities, are mainly built on the web, and entire web is built on the top of open source software and open standards. Now, on the top of these two, two products are coming. One is the open access publishing system. Another is the open learning. Concepts are interrelated with each other, and almost they are inseparable from each other. If you are talking about open learning system, your entire learning system is based on the top open access publishing system. And open access publishing system means all kind of resources you need for teaching, learning, evaluation, the e-books, journals, and many other. So this particular uh, you know, uh, uh, screen, uh, if you can see this, so the, there I actually given two words. One is the blue word in number of new print journal introduced in a given year. The major indicates number of new e-journals. So blue bar is the print journal and maroon bar is the you know um, uh, online journal. Uh, new online and new print journals in a given year. So 
there is the report from 1991 to 2006. After 2006, also the same trend continues. Here you can see the first online journal appeared in 1996, around three to four. Then within four years, it outnumbered uh, the print journals, the new print journals, and you see the situation in 2006. The number of new online journals in, uh, actually reached uh, up to almost 3,000, and print journal reduced to to four. So this is called paradigm shift. The moment our educational materials started in the format from print P, that very moment our academia has also changed. Uh, the after effect is coming now. Pi pandemic is basically working as a facet of uh, you know uh, almost one uh, once Hadari said that uh, pandemic issues are this kind of uh, you know global pandemic is basically fast forward the historical process. So it is actually, it is actually fast forwarding the revolution which already took place in during the mid, uh, you know, uh, in the decade or middle of the decade of, uh, first decade of 21st century. The same happened to e-books also. If you see the e-books, it's a future projection of e-books. Uh, from 2017 to 2024, you see how they are, how they will be earning revenues in future ebooks, and this is the number of users. How ebook users are increasing, and it will be increasing in 2024. This particular statistical future statistics calculated before pandemic, but the pandemic is actually again fast forwarded this particular usage of e uh, documents. But Fortunately, another you know estimate is there that by 2015, all almost 47 percent of these resources, these books and journals are already available in some kind of open access channel. And by 2040, 100 percent will be available in open access channel. Now. Uh, this is a good news, but at the same time, it's a bad news in the sense these resources are distributed throughout the globe, and there is no, you know, single integrated search services which can help you to put all um, books available in the open access channels and all journal papers available in the open access channel. It is the role and duty of library professionals to produce these services to their faculty, colleagues, students for greater access and greater knowledge. And this already happened. The open access revolution already happened. The whole world was the e and 47 to 50 percent of the documents commercially available. Karma also available in open access channel. The roots and avenues we need to understand. And by 2004, every knowledge object produced by academia, scientists, researcher will be available in the open access channel. So this is one factor as far as documents are considered, but we, we typically call it the library trinity. In typical library, library of any type and size, there are the three facets, your users, your documents, and your services or staff. Okay, so that is basically related to the document, now related to the user. So you see here, because of the population explosion in entire globe, more people are alive now, than have lived and died in the end of human history together. So the world is most populated now, and as a result, more and more people are coming to the higher education. For example, I am giving you a simple related to the college density as you are uh, all associated with the education of uh, the country. That college density of India, year one, the national average of college density in India is 28. What does it mean? That means per eligible people, we have only eight colleges to offer. Now, perhaps of eligible people belonging to the age group of 18 to 23. So, within the age of age group of 18 to 23, for our lakhs of such uh, you know, eligible people, we have only 28 colleges to offer. But within the country, it varies like anything. For example, if you go to the Bangalore urban district in Karnataka, the college density is as high as 50. If you come to Khan, the college density is as low as 7. You can, uh, you all can have this kind of data sets from the uh, latest, uh, you know, report of All India Survey of Higher Education. It is available from the NIC.ins and uh, that kind of, you know, horrific statistics are now coming. So this is, uh, we are not quite ready to accommodate all the learners presently available in the country. 
In one minute, the entire world is producing 100 GB of textual data. 100 GB of textual data is equal to content of the 20 college libraries. You see, for every minute, we are getting input of 20 college libraries, and most of them are basically junk. So we simply do know that uh, from this jungle of information, how to find out the most relevant, most authentic information. Again, here lies the rules of the, you all, all know the role, you know, uh, the spreading of fake news in this pandemic uh, situation. Here also lies the role of library professional uh, to uh, teach their academic colleague and uh, students that how to judge a news, how to judge a particular piece of writing, whether these are actually authenticated or not, and source-wise, how can we, you know, judge a news, whether it's a fake or true. So this is another challenge. Third or fourth, uh, you know, criteria is coming that we are entering slowly into information economy. Uh, you all know that there are three re revolutions in the human uh, civilization, agricultural society, then industrial society, then knowledge society. So Sorry, knowledge to, society will sir. be based on information. Sir? Uh, the screen yes, is yes. not visible. Yes. But connection is there. But I am connected. What do you What do you see now? So um, there is no screen. Up to which slide you can view it? Sir, I have knocked just when the side is invisible. Okay, fine. It's better. It is now. Can you see? Not yet, sir. Not yet. Can you see it now? Not yet, sir. We again request all the participants to keep their video off. There are several participants who have kept their video on and it is causing network problems for all of us. Please keep your microphone in the mute mode by clicking on the microphone icon in your screen and also turn your video off by clicking Yes, sir, it's visible now. Okay. <laughs> Anyway, so what I was talking about is basically the information economy. We already witnessed the key revolution in human society, that is agriculture revolution, industrial uh, in, uh, revolution, and knowledge society. So knowledge society will be based on information economy. I'm just giving you one example. So suppose it is not that in the society that one particular era finished and that uh, then we enter in the new era. Say, for example, agricultural uh, you know, era finished, then, then we have entered industrial era. Industrial era finished, then we have entered you know, uh, in knowledge era. It's not like that. Particularly in a developing country like India, where our head lies in 21st century and still, still lies in the 18th century, there all the society actually coexist in the same time. For example, if you look into your kitchen, you have you know uh, the mixer grinder, uh, an equipment of 20th century. But at the 
in time if you have seal your you know uh, kitchen so uh, you are carrying the legacy of the paleolithic age so this kind of you know coexistence is everywhere so information economy means that uh, where 70% of the population of a society somehow related to different information we teacher and students are belonging to this information activities we are basically intermediary we read we uh, consume we uh, uh, mix it with our intuition intelligence and then uh, teach with our uh, teach our students so this kind of activities are all called knowledge activity we belonging to the information economy now why information economy in this became so important because 80% of the technologies which are which we are basically facing we are actually observing and experiencing now all are based on information either it is based on information processing or it is based on information communication you look around you just now that uh, four to five technologies surrounding you are basically either processing information or communicating information never has technology been so focused on the access of information so that is another important factor as a result because of the many people are involved in the research activities educational activities knowledge is growing very fast and what is happening what we teachers teach our student in their very first year of university or college that become outdated when they graduate this is uh, suppose in a three year course in a college suppose in uh, any major subject uh, say chemistry physics or any kind of uh, major or honor subject what the very concept you again check in the third year that that so we are all need to fit to get on with it so that is the challenge that is the real and process <clears throat> knowledge become obsolete now it is very quickly incredibly fast and in future peter dukar you all know the management guru is uh, peter dukar he said that all educational industry uh, amongst all educational industry like you know uh, primary education secondary education tertiary education the number one industry will be professional education of adult in the next 30 years so there will be the continuing adult continuing education will come into the focus in the prime focus in the coming 30 years as peter dukar as a management guru said and i think he is uh, quite right in this and already principal sir quoted alvin toffler uh, that uh, one of the greatest of our time the illiterate of the 21st century will not be those who cannot read or write but those who cannot learn unlearn and relearn now if you come to the higher education scenario of india there is again uh, you know various factors that act, that actually leading, leading to Uh, learn and learn and relearn in the teaching learning evolution facet so first is the higher education in india uh, there are uh, we are one of the biggest in, in the world but we are not not the finest <clears throat> okay so i am just trying to give within 5 minutes the three prime factors basically uh, you know uh, related with the higher education scenario in india now we are the best but the system is quite uneven Thousand universities, forty thousand colleges, ten thousand plus standalone institutes. Institutes. We have a good set of distance and education and well mode universities. All almost hundred well mode. But the problem is that I already said once that college density is very poor. We have only national average is only twenty eight. It should be around eighty plus, but we have twenty eight. Second is the you know uh, student progression. Uh, the student who is actually entering in, inside the college education going to the pg courses in different universities and submitting their pg phd or doctoral dissertation are only 0.5% in india in indian uh, universities and colleges we all together offer 187 plus programs but 80% students are actually opting for only 10 programs and most of these state programs belonging to arts arts humanities and social sciences so most of the two students are basically entering in uh, inside the higher education through arts humanities and social uh, look in the number of uh, so 8% of the phd uh, degree uh, awardees are basically belonging to stem science technology engineering and man management 
so that is again an unevenness in in indian uh, situation next unevenness is ptr people to teacher ratio in college college it is around uh, it is 30 plus actually and in it is 20 plus but ideally in university system where many specialization courses we are offering it should be 1 is to 5 and at the college level it should be 1 is to 20 but the greatest unevenness in the country in the higher education scenario of our country is the gross enrollment ratio so on the one hand saying we cannot accommodate our new learners we have very poor college density but if you take into the real picture the gross enrollment ratio in india uh, the now you know the uh, average is the national average is 26.3 and that also varies a great uh, throughout the country if you go to the delhi ncr region it uh, goes as high as 50.6 uh, if you come down to the southern part of the country it is all uh, higher than the national average tamil nadu lead uh, is leading from the southern state 49.0 followed by kerala but if you take into a look from the entire western central and eastern india we are pulling our country back as far as gross enrollment ratio is concerned our national average is 26.3 but you see the entire western central and eastern asia are actually below than the national average in west bengal we are only pulled in 19.3 some of the northeastern states are doing very good 53.9 some are doing very bad 18.7 so what i said actually uh, what i tried to mean here that we have many daily facts many unevenness in higher education but the biggest unevenness is the gross enrollment ratio we fail to attract uh, you know um, uh, people inside our higher education system tertiary educational system and inside the tertiary education system uh, you know different regions actually varies a lot uh, so that is actually creating lot many problems in case of higher education in india why i said education is uh, uh, very important in uh, gross enrollment ratio in higher education is very important so two factors i am giving you <clears throat> if we compare our situation with the other asian Where you see South Korea top the list, or they already touched 82, followed by the Japan, they already touched 63. But the peculiar case happened with India and China. We actually saffron line indicates India, red line indicates China. We started better than China during 70s, continued up to 1994 in a better position. Then in 1994, China made a quantum jump, and there is a reason that why 1994 is actually a break-even point. 1994. in made a quantum jump they reached up to 49.3 and we are still struggling with 26.3 so why it happened i will be coming uh, uh, another factor that is called demographic bonus but before that why g is more important you see here the education the field of education is a peculiar field you know that no one considers you until and unless you contribute back to the knowledge consumer of knowledge has no importance in educational and knowledge industry the contributor of knowledge has importance so who has it gone of the days again it's a relearn previously you see most of the world uh, you know uh, richest people are the people who has it like sultan of brunei Uh, he was the most uh, you know uh, rich man uh, in the world but nowadays it is either mark zuckerberg or uh, bill gates both actually uh, uh, you know came from the middle class background and because previously it was who has it now it is who knows it so who has it is replaced by who knows it now who knows is uh, is calculated by the number of research and original contribution made knowledge pool you contributed back to the knowledge pool how how we can measure that by number of research articles we analyze corpus database it's a bibliographic database from the last 25 years united states you can see here the list with 120 million papers in the uh, you know last 25 years china is a distant 60 million paper in india we still manage top 10 position we are, uh, we are in ninth position but actually contributed only 16.70 million of paper, millions of paper the problem is that if we fail to attract uh, you know talented people in higher education 
if our classrooms are blanks, then this will be this will be happening because we will be contributing less and less in the knowledge pool. So that is the importance of gross enrollment ratio. Finally, you know, class comes from the mass. If we cannot have mass in the class, class will not come. So that is again a relearning of the situation. Now, second important relearning. As I said, that China made a quantum jump in 1994. Here you will come to know the reason. This demographic division, when in a country, working age population is basically larger than the non-working age share of the population. That means people belonging to the age group 15 to 64, who, when higher than the people who are below 40, higher than 60, is called a dem uh, is actually considered that the country has got a demographic dividend. Your working age population is higher age population because people below than 14 and our senior citizens need to depend on the working population for their you know living. So in India, uh, we entered into the demographic dividend era in the year 2018. Our median age is now is 28.1, and we are youngest in the Asia. Japan is the oldest, 47.3, followed by China, 37.4. If you go to the entire US and UK uh, and Europe, Germany is the oldest nation, 47.1. But if we go for some, some kind of you know more realistic analysis, you see. In case of Asian countries, all countries enjoy demographic bonus. For Japan, it is actually started in 1964 and ended in 2004. You all know the spectacular growth made by Japan during this period. For China, it started in 1990. I said 1994 is the break-even point for China. They invested a huge amount of money for restructuring their higher education to combat the demographic bonus. That means number of young populations will be higher in your country in with the older uh, you know age people so 1994 it started for them it ending by 2031 china and uh, thailand uh, you know uh, the same thing happened 1994 similarly the same thing is happening now from india and bangladesh we entered to, uh, in bonus era in 2018 it will be ended for us for 2025 we already spent two years in it 37 years ago we got Bangladesh got 34 years of window because of their uh, low positioning compared with India. The same thing happened in Thailand. So you all know that China made a seven-fold jump in their GDP period. But one point of caution, only demographic dividend cannot lead you anywhere. If your higher education system is not actually quite equipped with the, uh, you know, uh, 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 the challenges. Also got the demographic dividend from 2006. For them, it will be ended by 2038. Uh, but during this period, Brazil could only make twofold increase in their GDP because they have not invested only in restructuring their higher education. So for India, it's a great opportunity, a great chance for the next 37 years. We will be the youngest nation of the country of the world. We will be supplying. Uh, you know, most of the workforce uh, uh, to the uh, world, and uh, if our higher education is not quite enough, uh, is not sufficient enough to skill our, uh, you know, young population, then they will be unemployable, and many kind of social unrest will be in the pipeline in future if our higher education system not actually changing. So the below portion of this slide shows you that how our non population is coming down from 60s to 2018, then our working age population is increasing, and again our non-working age population will be increasing from 2055. So this is the 37-year uh, window we got in the uh, in the form of demographic dividend. But <clears throat> if we come down that whole population, not many good news is there, and not many bad news is there. I have seen with you first that <coughs> government of India already avoid this particular fact of the poor college density, uh, you know, many young learners, uh, we do not have employable skills uh, for the young learners, etc. They all know. So, uh, one is 
the NAC, National Academic Depository. In future, all mark sheets and certificate will be delivered online through NAC, and there will be no need for transcription and uh, donor can uh, easily uh, employ our you know, students. This is you all know from the country. Project Impact, we are funding uh, academy coming up with the innovative e-learning project. NIRF is the ranking of universities and colleges and many other learning institutes. And recently started another you know, program which many colleges. Every college must have a presence in the Ministry of Education so that it can help our students to uh, you know, uh, ranking. So these are these are the good news. That seven related projects are coming to combat the uh, demographic dividend. But the bad news is that I have had the same thing for the last five years. From 40 to 55, if you take the education budget as the percentage of the central budget, it is re reducing from 6.15. If we calculate in terms of total government expenditure, it is also reducing from 4.1 to 3.40 in the from 1415 financial year to 1920 financial year. And GDP is always a poor uh, state of affair in India. We never reached or uh, touched percent of GDP in higher education. But the highest was in 1415, 0.53. Then it is decreasing. And revised estimate from 2019-20 is not 0.45. It is actually 0.41. So on the one, we are uh, taking up many of the you know innovative projects, but on the other hand, we do not have fund to the project we initiated. For example, recently Ministry of Education announced a new education policy, but in the budget there is no option to implement that new educational policy of the country. So that is the story of the higher education as far as it is concerned. <laughs> so if we go for a summary kind of thing, if you go for a summary kind of thing, you see here the entire higher education is actually the factors, low GR, uneven quality, shortage of educated, unemployed, low student progression from UG to and local budget. And government of India is thinking of e-learning as a solution. So as a teacher, you be very sure or please be in that in future there is lockdown or no lockdown, pandemic or no pandemic, the entire higher education of India already uh, took a U-turn and that, that is actually moving towards the, you know, I think there is some network problem with Professor Patasarthi's Mukhabadhaya's connection. Okay. Uh, uh, yes, presently. Uh, okay, I, re I rejoined. Uh, I rejoined, but it, it is actually raining heavily here. So there will be some kind of, you know, a network problem uh, I'm expecting. It's raining really heavy here. I'm again trying. So what actually government of India is thinking that all the problems or the ailing factors will be combat, uh, will be uh, with the ELANS solution. Now, uh, in the ELANS, we use this particular term as an umbrella term. We indicate as e-learning. 
Are you getting me, Tanushree? Yes, sir. Hello. Yes, sir. Hello. Yes, sir. Okay. Okay. Fine, yes, sir. Fine. The slide is also so, visible. <clears throat> okay. So, uh, what is happening? You know, uh, we all ultimately we use e-learning as a generic umbrella term to indicate every activity we are doing inside our classroom. For example, you are uh, distributing your soft copies to your uh, students. You are, uh, you know, presenting your uh, PowerPoint slides in uh, your LCD project. Many of the college and universities are now equipped with a smart classroom. So everything is e-learning. Truly, it is e-learning uh, because we are using some kind of ICT enabled, uh, you know, learning. System, but <clears throat> as a teacher, we need to understand that we cannot utilize interchangeably or synonymous terminologies in the domain of e-learning. There are three distinct you know, uh, systems in the domain of e-learning. One is called digital learning environment, when we are offering our courses in a structured fashion over the network in an interactive mode. This is called digital synchronous mode of communication, so that you are teacher to teacher, teacher to learner, learner to learner communication is possible. So then we call virtual learning environment because of the virtual communication tools. And when your virtual communication, virtual learning environment is actually attached with other institutional subsystems like your library system, like your online admission system, like your, uh, you know, uh, examination uh, system, like your uh, financial subsystem, then we call a managed learning environment. So managed learning environment will, will be a single point of access for your students and teachers in future where they can do everything, every activities related with teaching, learning, evaluation, including admission, examination, library access, everything. So presently in India, we are in between VLE and MLE. I will try to show you live a few snapshots related to managed learning environment. Teacher of higher education in India, and MOOCs you all know, MOOCs is basically a virtual learning environment, but it, but, but it is massive. DLE, VLE, and MLE are meant for a single institute, a group of institutes. But MOOCs is basically working at the national level, can university level. Any number of courses can be offered for any number of you know, learners. So it's a massive in nature, and comes the blended learning. When you are utilizing any of this, help of any of DLE, VLE, MLE, or MOOCs, alongside your traditional brick and mortar classroom based teaching, that is called blended learning. So, in future, in the coming three, four years in India, it will be a dynamic continuum between the um, uh, you know, uh, <clears throat> traditional learning and virtual learning, and there will be blended learning. Because one fine morning, we cannot have virtual learning. We need to pass through the blended learning, a judicial mixture of traditional equipments alongside the virtual equipments. All of the courses, DLE, DLE, MLE, or MOOCs, the primary building block are the digital learning object. What are the digital learning objects? Suppose you are uh, showing a slide. Suppose this PowerPoint slide is a digital learning object. but only it's a digital learning object if it is shareable under communication, if it is associated with the set of metadata, who developed it, for whom it is developed, what are the prerequisites, uh, what it is meant for, everything, all this metadata when associated with this particular PowerPoint slide, available under Creative Commons licenses, so that any other teacher, any other student can repurpose it for their purpose, you know, uh, other, you know, uh, uh, activities, they can call it a learning object. And digital learning object in the form of slide, in the form of e-text, in the form of video tutorials are forming the building block of any kind of e-learning system. I already we talked about, but this is uh, you know, a final definition given by Lorila about the VLE. VLE is a growing and dynamic environment in which education is changed culturally, institutionally, and technically. It's a very nice definition. Now, what are the major difference between the VLE MLE versus traditional learning environment? The major difference from library point of view is that in case of a traditional learning environment, the classroom and libraries are two separate entities. Normally after taking the class, we give a set of references, then our students go to the library, collect the documents, read it. But in case of VLE or Emily, the library need 
to be present inside the e-learning system. My students, my learners won't be going to the library. Library will be coming inside the e-learning workflow, and that is called the push model for the previously it was pull model for the library. Library was pulling the users. Now library need to push them inside the e-learning system. So that is one of the major uh, unlearn and relearn for the librarians. Then for the teachers, we need to uh, know in case of additional environment, we have institution-driven learning system. But in place of that, it will be user-driven learning system because user will be learning. Learners will be accessing our materials according to their own time and place. No students under the sun are same, but we teach all of them a one hour lesson and expect all of them to come up uh, with good marks. But that is not possible. Student A may be very good in topic X. Student B may be very good in topic Y. So we have to, really virtual learning environment is giving every student uh, a scope to learn by their own place. Say for example, one particular topic is uh, one uh, student is fine difficult. He can repeat the classes for five, ten number of times because this is available in the video tutorial. But the, in the reality, we cannot, you know, uh, conduct a class more than twice. So that is the uh, one of the uh, difference of uh, VLE, what we have to learn, uh, relearn as a teacher. And another relearning is that there will be lot many sophisticated monitoring and tracking system but in case of traditional learning environment we have only registers and tutor, uh, tutorial records but that, now i can know i have 30 minutes of video in which particular minute in which particular second in which particular frame my student my learner actually withdrawn uh, himself, herself on the video. So I can take a look that what, what, went, what went wrong in that particular video, in that particular frame, I can, you know, uh, uh, readjust and I can reload that particular one. So this kind of sophisticated monitoring systems that I can, uh, you know, uh, track my students every second what they are doing, what, uh, what what time they have passed in this particular tutorial, what time they have taken uh, for, you know, uh, answering a particular question, everything I can, you know, uh, know, in, including the plagiarism check inside. So, that kind of, you know, sophisticated monitoring and tracking is not possible in this traditional learning environment. Now, Government of India is giving all layer architecture. At the core of the code, there will be a learning object repository. So, all the e-text, all the video tutorial, all the PowerPoint slides you are preparing for different courses will be available in a repository. It's called LOR, Learning Object Repository. A learning object repository in the central position, and then it will be connected to different kind of teaching learning evaluation software. We normally call them LCMS, Learning Content Management System. But many people also call them LMS, Learning Management System, and many people also call them a kind of CMS, content management system. But uh, the, you know, approved term or the most popular term uh, is basically the LCMS, learning content management system. Now, teacher, we are more concerned with the content architecture rather than the technical architecture. If you come to the level architecture, so that this uh, study given a very beautiful if your learning is not based on this particular model, you will not be getting any score in API. I will be coming to API also, how you can give it to the part in healing activity. We have given a clear cut instruction that you first take your syllabus. Then syllabus will be having number of papers or each unit will be having topics. So if your syllabus is very structured, then half of the job is already done. You need to under the unit. So each topic will be supported by the four parameters. There will be an e tutorial. You can prepare a video of the audio of the topic. You can upload that video object in YouTube. 
learning system. I will be showing you live demonstration. Don't worry. Don't worry. So this is for point one. You need to prepare video tutorial. Now suppose you are not equipped with the prepare video tutorial. Although there are many open source software available nowadays, it's very easy to prepare a video tutorial. But suppose you are not in a position to prepare your own video tutorial. So in this place, video tutorial prepare click anywhere in the world. Available under Creative Commons license, and you can embed that one inside your learning system. So that is the power of. Now, according to what Government of India or Ministry of Education is proposing, that next you have to prepare a summary text, either in the form of PDF or a slide, uh, for, uh, to cover the topic uh, you are targeting. Important you will be having for the reading list, and. As far as possible, your other should include open access resources. And there, your librarian, your friends from library can be a very helpful for a teacher. So they can easily identify what are the open access resources available in your topic, what are the sources, what are the tertiary and secondary sources in your domain, and can guide you how to have an e-book, book chapter, uh, you know, journal article. Uh, through open access channel under, under the creative models, they are champion of it, they can help you. But uh, you have to slowly learn it. So this is called Quad Entry. You have to prepare a further reading list in the form of uh, open access resources. And Quad and 4 is the evaluation or assessment, uh, either in the form of short or online assign assignment submitted or MCQ based. For example, the LCMS, the open source LCMS we are using called Moodle. Moodle supports almost 36 days in the need and say we try only four to five types. But Moodle actually provides you a weaker options in your MCQ. Even you can upload video and you can take text in, 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 in place of the uh, raw text-based comprehension. So this kind of opportunities are there, video file upload, audio file upload, then we can take a test. So this approach we teacher need to know very well, and we need to follow this particular you know, uh, uh, model. Otherwise, government of India won't need it. Let me show this is many uh, that important. So again, this is the four quadrant, and each quadrant requires different you know, tasks. So you are all teachers, you know what is what is the object. Now you need to learn to other things. Where is the knowledge related to your domain? How to find out different kind of open access resources? And second is that how to disseminate those kind of um, those knowledge in, in the form of a capsule, in, for, in the form of four quadrant to your students. So in the quadrant three, that is the further reading list, you need to have, you need to learn actually and we are reference management software because at the end of the day you have to prepare all the lists in the form of a citation style by following a citation style, either APA style or RTPE style or nature style of question. Open source reference management software available that will make your job easy. And different kind of open courses. Open courses uh, available uh, from uh, Teaching Common, from Open Learning. Uh, oercommons.org, uh, then Moodle uh, is providing an archive. So from where you can download the open course and we can utilize as it is basis inside our courses if it is matching uh, our purpose and objective. Then the quad two, you have to learn again different kind of open access and open learning. Slide repositories, because there are many slide repositories. You can quickly search a slide on a given topic and you can frame your own slide on the top of it, and if the slide is available under Creative Commons licenses with due acknowledgement, you can utilize the sort of, you know, uh, 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 slide taking uh, there. The different kind of slide preparation tool you already know. So in the quadrant one, that is the video tutorial preparation, you need to know skin dust software. In the Windows, uh, in the Linux, we have Kazam. Screen testing software is basically, suppose I am uh, uh, running this particular uh, PPT and giving my voice, voice will be recorded and at the, at the end of my presentation it will create a video object just presently you are doing with YouTube. So this kind of things you can do in your local machine, either laptop or desktop. 
the proof based video recording tools you can utilize the best uh, in windows is obs open broadcasting system but in linux we uh, uh, prefer vocus screen it's uh, better but you can start with obs obs is available in both windows you know linux then after you prepare your video to see you know how to create youtube channel in your college then you need to upload that one you if you click share in a youtube youtube video it it will give you a iphone embedding that iphone you can get inside your system that is called video embedding in the point for you need to learn how to start mcq type question and mcq type question should not be based on the factual one w what who when how etc it should be open ended because when you are taking a uh, you know uh, in the learning system your students are allowed to answer anything i will mean, under the sun you simply do not have a proactive examination system like this in a learning environment so you need to be very cautious in setting up a questionnaire so that it not include question which the uh, student can google it and will get the information it must be open ended and many workshop conducting presently uh, for teachers how to frame open ended questions and how we can repack those questions in the, in, in a lcm system uh, so three great point to start uh, to uh, discover different kind of e learning activities one is the oer commons don't worry about the U All URLs are given here, and our OER Commons will help you to discover open learning object in your subject domain, and by following the educational level also. So you can you know download the entire zip file, entire learning package, and you can reutilize inside your. Next is the consortium. It's like your thesis repository, different kind of you know. Uh, OER consortium is coming. Open educational resources. So this one is basic uh, cataloging all the consortium of the world in the domain of uh, open education, and you can have your material from there in one single window search interface. OER consortium. But the third is basically developed by the teachers by themselves. So this is called Teaching Commons. Us. Uh, that is the url uh, it's a global initiative uh, based on us so what it says that as a teacher if i have developed some kind of open learning object i can donate those open learning object under creative commons license in, in this forum similarly i can adapt the open learning object developed by my colleagues in different part of the world on that very topic so this are the, this is a basically a sharing platform for uh, teachers all over the world right from the school teacher to the university teacher it's a interesting site you can uh, you can you may to uh, take a look of it these are actually i'm not these details uh, urls are given these are all open educational repositories where you can find out your uh, learning object uh, you know under available under uh, creative commons licensing and these are uh, oer specific sites actually based on uh sub base they are basically subset of google but some are very important like zorun it's a very good one uh, then uh, this is my favorite oer recommend oer recommended.org so all the urls i have given here these are uh, not like google google is basically covering the uh, entire resources of of the world but this is engine covers only open educational resources in your domain so search by keyword like just like google and you can have it So these are the OERs and OER search engines. Uh, will, will be that will be useful. And as uh, many times I am saying, Creative Commons licensing. You now need to know what is Creative Commons license. Creative Commons license is basically there are two groups in in the academic world. One is the copyright thinking. That means when you are publishing a paper, a chapter in a commercial publisher uh, in it is. their copyright you are giving to the publisher but many of us many of the teachers do not know that we have legal right to upload the print version of that chapter or journal for 
pristine version of that particular book chapter of journal paper in any of the open access repositories of the world. And that will be available under different degree of freedoms. And this Creative Commons licensing is giving you the degree of freedom. If matter is available under CC0, that means everything is possible. Fixing, commercial use, free uh, utilize, adaptation, adaptation. But if I am giving CC, BY, and CND, that means remixing is not allowed, commercial use is not allowed, derivative work is not allowed, and you can only, you cannot do anything. So you need to be very about the degree of freedom, that is the license associated with the open learning object or open educational resources. If it is CC0, then you are free to do anything. If it is CC BY, you are almost free to do anything. So we have a comparative study of AMD derivative and NC stands for non-commercial. Then another uh, no, uh, uh, equivalent uh, group is coming. Uh, or Creative Commons is mainly dedicated towards the copyleft zone or the open access zone. But there are many resources. So suppose one particular photograph available in a college library. Now the librarian do not know who photographed it. Uh, to whom it belongs. So these are called orphan resources. In case of orphan resources, orphan resources, how can we utilize different kind of life agreement? Say in copyright, no copyright, and other. So we can select, uh, you know, three border groups. So rights statements is slightly broader than the Creative Commons. If you are not quite sure whether it is available in uh, in copyright or uh, no copyright or others like orphan. So it is in a big way. So these two things we need to know as a teachers. And uh, EPG Parsala, you all know. Uh, so that's uh, uh, giving us uh, uh, Indian higher education uh, 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 a kind of, you know, uh, uh, a kind of, um, you know, boost in a months. But this particular site, you possibly do not know who it is called. Bidhamitra. So Bidhamitra is a new initiative of Inflipnet. It's an RUC under UGC where I can find out all kind of course materials produced from India. Because now India also many e-learning initiatives are going on. So Bidhamitra is a single window search interface where I can read e-learning resources which are produced in Tark. So it's a very good initiative presently going on. Bidhamitra, the uh, URL is also given in now, as a teacher, you are, uh, as Tonushi uh, already told me that uh, I need to cover something about this one API. So here you see, <coughs> you can download the latest UGC regulation of, uh, you know, API related issues, uh, July 18, 2018, it actually published, that is the latest one. If you go to page number 105 and table number 2, you will be finding the you know, a uh, marks given for e-learning in different e-learning institutes. If you are providing something in MOOC courses as a coordinator, you will be getting 20. If you have a particular unit in a MOOC course, you will be getting 5. If you are involved with editing works of a MOOC course, you will be getting 2. If you are in a course, course, you will be getting 4. But remember, Remember, all of this must be in full quadrant mode. So this is related to the MOOCs courses going on in Swayam and Swayam Prova. But if in the level you are developing e-content and in the four quadrant mode, then for each course you will be getting 12 marks. This is not related with the MOOCs. You can develop inside your... If you are developing e-content as a part of the course, you will be getting five marks each for, uh, for each unit. It's supported by the four quadrant, e-text, video tutorial, further reading list, and MCQ-based evaluation. And if you are contributing in some other ways like editorial, etc. Two for every such, and editor of e-content, you will be getting 10 for each activity. So huge number of, you know, uh, scores are allotted for e-learning activities, government of India and ministry trying to uh, motivate teachers of uh, colleges and universities to take part in different kind of e-learning activities. So you please go through this particular page 1052. Uh, all details are given there and this will be clear to you. 
So now, talk demonstration, it will take another five minutes that how in future learning should be look like. Tanushri, uh, can you uh, tell me that whether you my browser or not? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. It's visible. Okay, thank you. So, suppose this is a really we develop uh, for our department because of this law conflict. And uh, uh, we have not spent a single poisa uh, for the university. Why? Because we are using a free model that is called modelcloud.com. It is in the site so in the CV. So any teacher, not a code model, initially they say that it will be available for 45 days. But take it from me, I am using model for the last 10 years ever take back the course from the teacher. If your students are accessing regularly, if you are accessing it regularly, they never stop you. You better go to modelcloud.com. You can open up your courses. A limitation of 200 uh, students and 400 MB of space. Quite enough for a college and university course. So we are running here four courses. Now, in this course lose. This is the course. If, if a student clicks it, see what they will see. It may little bit of time take little bit of time because I'm showing uh, trying to show life more. So this is a course is based on four quadrant uh, model. Now you see here the moment my user actually enters inside the course, they have the object course. And a glossary. So glossary is a very, you know, initiative to involve your students in, uh, you know, at the uh, basic step, uh, uh, you know, uh, beginning of your e-learning system. It's a collaborative glossary. You as a teacher define 50 terms. Now give your student a task that each of you have to come with uh, five unique terms in the domain or in the topic in, in the course we are covering and you have to give the term as well as uh, you have to give the definition and they cannot copy because immediately you can check from particular source it is coming so this collaborative glossary collaborative wiki are very good initiatives uh, we can involve our student e-learning then I can create a chat service to for, as a doubt clearing session the moment my student clicks its chat room they can enter inside the chat room. One particular, uh, you know, chat box will be coming. So I can announce that I will be available in the chat room for clearing doubts on the related to this particular topic. You can join me. So my students can join me. They can raise their hand. They can post their question. And we can uh, have a uh, fruitful discussion on a given. It's a very simple chat box. Is, it's inbuilt. You don't have to install anything. Now, <clears throat> As a college teacher, I am quite sure that you have conducted many online Zoom me, this kind of Zoom, Google Meet, and WebEx. These are all web conferencing system, not meant for online classes. There are specific open source sources, open source <coughs> available to conduct online classes. One of that we are using is called Big Blue Button. So if my student click here, they can join a class. The class will have a whiteboard. I can write it there. I can hi highlight a particular point. My student can raise their <coughs> hand. <coughs> they can so uh, they can action. And they all can have, we can have, we can really imitate the classroom based environment inside this Big Blue Button automatically available with uh, as a uh, as an add-on in your model. Now you see, this is the actual unit is starting from here. So this is basically the beginning part of uh, the course unit. So here you see, unit is this. And unit has following topic. Now suppose I am targeting this topic, ILS transition. So against each topic, I need to have a core quadrant. 
some technical problems sir uh, have left the meeting he will try to join shortly i have rejoined i am just again trying to present Can you see it? Hello. Not yet, sir. Can you see? It? Can you Not see? Not yet, sir. Not. Okay. okay. Just wait a bit. Okay. Visible, so but you are you are audible. Okay, then, uh, 
Hmm. Okay, then better you start your question answer session because possibly the network will not support because it is raining heavily here. So, all important hour of my prior uh, deliberation I have covered. So let us start question answer session. Okay, okay, sir. Thank you for such an informative session. Um, I will. Uh... <coughs> <coughs> sir, uh, our. Principal sir has uh, asked, explain the U-turn of higher education. Okay. Uh, what I am uh, seeing that, that we are all habituated with the traditional learning environment. But as the point I have given or the factors I have given related to the Indian higher education system, that in future, it, it is actually not depending on this pandemic issue or lockdown issue. In future, government of India will be going for the e-learning uh, solution because it's a very low-cost solution. Because best of the business teacher can be, you know, uh, reach to the unreached, to the remotest village of, uh, villages of the country. Suppose an IIT professor teaching C language courses and a, a remote village in Mizoram, the boy can access it. So that kind of dream situation is coming through e-learning that is not quite possible through traditional learning. And... Uh, as we do not have fund and infrastructure to set up uh, good institutes in every nook and corner of the country, we have to depend on our best of the business teachers and we have to arrange uh, dissemination of their knowledge and skills to the remotest part of the country. So e-learning is coming up as a very local solution towards that direction and government of India is planning towards it. You are already having a uh, Siam and Swan program. Now, the U-turn of the college and universities is that in view of these particular initiatives and uh, direction uh, took, uh, already taken by our uh, central government, all higher educational institution, institutes should be starting the blended learning in the coming two, two, three years. Now, blended learning will be quite different from the traditional learning. The way we teach our students, the way we disseminate knowledge, the way we conduct our practical classes, Virtual remote lab is coming, virtual uh, you know, uh, remote uh, programming environment is coming. So a lot of new developments are coming up. And another thing is that in universities, we enjoy a very high speed internet connectivity that is called NKN connectivity, 2 Gbps connectivity. That will be extended up to college in the next six months. And from the college, it will be extended to the public libraries in every GB in the another next uh, another six months so the whole uh, infrastructure is uh, is in the pipeline and government of india is taking up this matter quite seriously we uh, teachers need to learn many new things we already know what is the knowledge because we are the subject expert now the three two other facets i uh, indicated where is the, the knowledge we need to be a good searcher we need to know how, what are the tertiary and secondary sources in my domain we, we need to take help on help up from our library and friends to discover the resources then we need to know different kind of licensing agreements different kind of software to prepare you know uh, our uh, courses so where is the knowledge and how to disseminate are coming the two u turns based relearning process for the teachers in coming future Thank you, sir. Uh, there is another question uh, from one of the participants named Dibbo Mojumdar asked, how will the laboratory learning be conducted during lockdown? Good, very good question. So, you, this is the, uh, you, so I, I, ho I do hope that if uh, the glimpse of the learning content management system you got through the demonstration process, although it's, uh, it uh, short-lived, but uh, let me assure you that Moodle is now compatible. Or why Moodle? Any open source learning management system is now compatible with VRL, Virtual Remote Library, where you can you know uh, <coughs> use a particular plugin inside the Moodle. You can upload your practical uh, you know, class video. You can add different kind of you know steps and protocols there, and your students can take part in the uh, virtual remote laboratory process. Similarly, another one important one is coming that is called VPL, virtual programming language environment. Suppose I am teaching a computer science course. I can prepare a C language interface there. I can give talks. My student can pro produce different kind of source code. They can compile that there and I can check the product. 
So this kind of BPL and BRL are coming up in a big way. An important thing is that uh, <clears throat> I, uh, when I will be sharing with this slide, I will give you a list. There is a Spanish Open University who are having a repository of all the practicals in physics, chemistry, and basic sciences at the UG level. So any of that you can link with your uh, Moodle site so that you, you don't have to do at your own uh, you know, uh, lab or own college. You can directly link if it is matching with your courses. So that repository URL I will be sharing with you with this uh, PPT. Thank you, sir. Um, uh, Shoma Agarwal asked, what is the essence of learn, unlearn and e-learn? How can we instill that to students? Um, I, I do hope that uh, now you know that uh, how many uh, you know, new things are coming up uh, for uh, forgetting the skills we have and relearning the new skill. For example, you all know how to set up questions, but most of our questions are basically targeting to judge the memory power of our student, not the reasoning power, power of our student. So that gone are the days for those kind of questions, discuss, describe, elaborate, comment, that kind of descriptive questions, gone are the days for, for those kind of questions, which actually checks memory of a student. Now the new era is actually complex telling us to go for different kind of questions which act, which will actually check the reasoning ability of the student, the logical ability of the student, the insight of the student. So these are called open-ended questions. In place of the factual question, we need to learn how to set up different kind of open-ended questions. So that is the uh, one of the uh, example of relearning and unlearning. Now comes, comes the question of student. Uh, whether they are, uh, you know, uh, they, they need any kind of training. I personally do not think that students need any kind of training at all. You see, I do not. I do not know your age group, but still, you see, your students are digital native. And with the teachers who are basically in the middle, uh, you know, age segment, 40 to 50, we are basically digital immigrants. We need training uh, better. If you give your student any kind of, uh, you know, low-cost devices, your uh, laptop or phone, within 10, 15 minutes, they will come up with some kind of innovative thinking because they are digital native. You try with your, uh, you know, uh, you know uh, with your uh, children in your home, they will be very quickly learning different kind of digital equipments without knowing even the philosophy and technology of that particular device. So students do not need training at all. We teachers need training. Hello. Yes, please. Uh, sir, Omlan they has asked, for the students of remote area of rural India, how they connect to us where no internet till date, sir? It's real problem. Yes, it's a real, it's real problem. I do agree with you. But you see, 20% to 30% student cannot access the classes. That means, can I, you know, deprive the rest 70 to 80% students? No, a big no, first of all. Second is that, one fine morning, the whole pandemic issue actually thrown upon us. We were not quite ready to face this kind of thing. So, one fine morning, you cannot have entire India is connected with a 2 Gbps link. But government plan, infrastructure, and equipment are there. It will be expanding up to GP level in a public library. In future, e-learning cannot operate in isolation. In future, public libraries will be partner of the schools so that a public library will be having an AV room and they will be connected with the uh, 2GPPS NKN connectivity. So in future, within coming six months, every you know, um, uh, uh, GP will be connected through NKN. That is one good news. Another good news is that low-cost device. So many you know, uh, students cannot have, they do not have mobile, they do not have laptop, how they can connect. So government of India is planning to have a low-cost device called Raspberry Pi. Raspberry Pi is a kind of computer which is available at the cost of 3.5 thousand only. 
and a raspberry pi server you can you know pick up in your pocket so that kind of revolution is happening in the hardware also so raspberry pi when connected with a uh, you know um, camera and sound devices etc can do you know uh, that is that is equipped with 4 gb ram and you search by the raspberry pi you will be getting uh, that what is happening in the hardware revolu what hardware revolution is happening and within 6 months there is a model called QT Pi with camera fitted and uh, 4GB RAM that will be distributed free of cost to every student who are holding BPL card. And in future, colleges and universities will not be getting building grants. They will be getting equipment grants. On the basis of that equipment grants, they have to buy uh, different kind of Raspberry Pi hardware and they have to distribute to the BPL card holder students. Okay, sir. Uh, Kosar Ansari has asked, please elaborate about MOOC and uh, the place, best platform uh, of MOOCs. Okay, what I am uh, trying to uh, tell you that do not think about MOOCs. Developing a MOOCs is not the uh, ball game of a college or a university. It needs huge infrastructure. We India, we are having only one MOOCs platform, Siam, and that is built on the Microsoft technology on the top of Open edX. So that kind of technology, a college, a university cannot build. It is meant for the nation. In the college and university or, or at your personal level, what you can think is the LCMS, Learning Content Management System. Either it can be in VLE mode or in MLE mode. So, Emily mode, I will again try after this question and answer session, if network uh, performs better, I can show you in live. So, as you try to develop a course for the learning quadrant model by using Moodle Cloud. And to start with for a teacher, uh, for a teacher, the best option is go for the Moodle. Moodle is very comprehensive, open source, anyone can download, anyone can install. If you do not have enough hardware resources, you can even start your course in Moodle Cloud as I have shown you. So don't think about MOOCs. MOOCs is the government business. Okay, sir. Uh, Sh Shujat, Shujata Shen has asked, uh, if I take the responsibility of running online FDP course as coordinator, what marks is allotted under category 3 in API? 10 for each coordinator, coordinatorship. 10 for each. Okay, sir. That's all we have till now. Okay. So should I uh, uh, try... Again, the Emily live demonstration process, or uh, should I end it here? No, sir, you, you can try once. Can you see it now? No, sir. Not no. yet. No, yeah, yeah, it's visible now. The white screen is visible now. No luck, don't see. <laughs> so it's okay. Okay. So then end it. Because then it's not support. Now I would request Dr. Yes, sir.
Now I would request Dr. Roibotak Shangupto to address vote of thanks on behalf of IQSA. Good afternoon, everyone. As we come to the end of this truly enriching webinar, I, on behalf of IQSC and the seminar committee of Vijayanarayan Mahavidyalaya, would like to take this opportunity to thank all of them who made this webinar possible. In the very beginning, I express my gratitude for the esteemed speaker, Dr. Partha Sarathi Mukhopadhyay, for his illuminating and captivating lecture. We hope that we would again have the opportunity of having him with us sometime in the future. I thank the participants who have joined from various corners of the country, making this webinar a success in the truest sense. I thank our respected principal, Dr. Gautam Beat, for his continuous support and guidance. Sincere thanks to Dr. Pinak Dotto, Coordinator, Internal Quality Assurance Cell of Vijayanarayan Mahavidyalaya, for all his initiatives and suggestions. I thank Mrs. Tanusri Bhadro, the convener of this webinar and the librarian of Vijayanarayan Mahavidyalaya. This webinar is basically her brainchild and she has worked tirelessly to ensure that this webinar is arranged successfully. Special thanks to Dr. Koshi Ghosh, Dr. Shoroj Ghosh, and other members of the Internal Quality Assurance Cell for the efficient organizational work. Thanks to Mr. Prithis Kumar Biswas, the convener of the seminar committee of Vijayanarayan Mahavidyalaya and other members of the seminar committee for doing their bits. I sincerely thank MSS Software and especially Mr. Shuhashis Dotto for all the tech support, all the tech support and uh, to make the YouTube broadcast of this webinar possible, which ensured that many participants could watch the webinar, although they couldn't be in this Google Meet. And I thank all the teachers and non-teaching members of our college, Vijayanarayan Mahavidyalaya, for all their support. And finally, I express my love to all our dear students and participants, without whom nothing would have been possible. So I thank everyone and conclude this vote of thanks. Thank you all for making this a success. An announcement that uh, the feedback link for this webinar will be mailed to all the registered candidates in their respective email IDs and they are requested to fill it in and submit to enrich us so that we can organize this uh, webinars more efficiently in the future. And please note that it will be active for a very short duration. So please submit it within 5 p.m. today. It will be mailed to you before that. So now we will have our national anthem, which will be played in your screen. And I request all of you to stand in reverence and pay homage to our soldiers and everyone in the country. Thank you, everyone.
जन जन मंगल दायक जय हे भारत भाग्य विधाता जय हे जय हे 